so this slide shows uh, when we think about the movement of AMR through the environment, there are a couple of different opportunities for mitigation. So how can we uh, provide treatment or other type of conservation practice that could actually um, limit or prevent the movement of the resistant organisms off-site. And so first of all, we can think about manure management. What are some different strategies for manure management that may reduce the concentrations of the antibiotics as well as the antimicrobial resistant organisms before the manure is um, applied to the field or put into the external environment? And we can also think about in-field management, different types of manure application strategies, uh, different manure application timing. Um, how can we apply the manure to the land in a way to best prevent movement off-site? Um, and then there's always the edge of field practices. When we think about conservation practices to uh, protect water quality, the edge of field is a really important place, that buffer that can um, intercept that uh, water that's flowing off stream provides some treatment before it discharges and moves downstream. And so now Shannon and I are both going to tell you about some of our different studies that um, intersect some of these different potential sources for uh, and places for mitigation in the environment. So I'll start with discussing a uh, suite of different studies that we conducted with funding from the National Pork Board which really looked at the fate of antimicrobials and ARGs after land application of swine manure. And so as Michelle mentioned, we're very interested in mitigation strategies, including things such as buffer strips, so those edge of field applications. Also, um, management strategies such as how the timing of manure application relative to precipitation on how antimicrobials and ARGs may be moving um, off of that cropland through runoff and potentially impacting surface water. And so um, there have been previous studies looking at antimicrobials and ARGs. Some of our studies, we were excited to be able to look at both of those two um, entities at the same time. So first I'm going to talk about a study where we looked at land application, so how manure was land applied. So we looked at three different strategies, broadcast manure, um, incorporation, and injection, manure injection. Um, and so it's much more common to see injected manure, um, but we also wanted to look at these other strategies as well. Um, we used a manure that we collected from a USDA research facility. Um, this was a really great manure source because it was very well characterized and we also had very good records on what antibiotics had been given to the um, animals that produced the manure. And we conducted this test through a series of uh, field scale runoff experiments co conducted at a experimental uh, farm at UNL. Uh, with collaboration from colleagues at USDA. And so just to, um, for interest of time, I'm just going to present one piece of data which focuses on the presence of chlorotetracycline, an antibiotic in runoff. And you'll see a couple of things here. First, you'll see that the concentration in runoff um, was highest when manure was broadcast or just spread onto the surface without any kind of incorporation. But you'll see that the concentrations were reduced when the manure was either injected or incorporated into the soil. Second, we ran experiments that had three sequential runoff events. So manure was applied, then rainfall occurred once, twice, and then three times um, in three uh, sequential days. And you'll see that the highest concentrations um, of antibiotics in runoff occurred with sort of that first uh, runoff event. So runoff event one typically had higher concentrations um, than the two subsequent runoff events. In a separate study, we were able to look at the transport of antibiotics, again, chlortetracycline and now lincomycin, in runoff when we either broadcast, which are the two plots on the A and C on the left side of the um, slide, or injected, which would be plots B and D manure, um, and then ran um, rainfall simulations 
But now our rainfall simulations occurred with a gap between application of manure and when rainfall occurred. We were incredibly fortunate the summer we ran this study that it actually, we had no natural rainfall, which is not always fortunate for producers, but for our experimental purposes, was very fortunate that we had a very dry summer. So we had no natural rainfall. And so we were able to control the rainfall and rainfall either occurred, we ran our rainfall simulation either one day after um, manure was land applied and that corresponds to the zero um, on the X axis of the plots one week, two weeks, or three weeks after manure application. And so for the plot with three weeks um, after manure application, there was no rainfall or um, occurring in that three week period. These were all different plots. And so what you can see is that timing of manure application relative to um, rainfall is also something that can really control the corresponding concentration and transport of antibiotics and runoff with much lower concentrations observed in um, those longer um, time period, uh, with, with a longer time period between manure application and, um, and the runoff event. Now, of course, that's not something that producers can always time. We don't always know when it's gonna rain, but it is something that could be used to develop guidance around manure application um, or applying manure in periods where there's less likely for rainfall to be occurring. In another study, we looked at, again, an edge of fields approach. So looking at antibiotic removal in narrow grass hedges. And so here's some data for Tylosin in runoff, um, which where swine manure was placed on one side of the grass hedge, uh, rainfall experiments were conducted, and then we collected the runoff after it had passed through the grass hedge. And you see the dark red bars correspond to the concentrations without any grass hedge, whereas the light pink bars correspond to the reduced concentration observed with the grass hedge. So we do see removal um, in these types of edge of field approaches for mitigating anti antibiotic movement from, um, from land applied manure. And so we've also had a chance to explore some of the manure management practices and infield practices. Um, but I really wanted to emphasize our work with Prairie Strips for the webinar today. And uh, this project is funded by the, the USDA and the work I'm presenting is that which was led by Laura Alt, um, who is a, now a postdoc in um, the Ag and Biosystems Engineering Department at Iowa State. And uh, when we when we got this project, um, we're first putting together the ideas. I mean, you know, prairie strips are a really popular practice with farmers because of the um, they don't take a lot of land out of production. They're placed at the edge of the field, and they have a lot of ecosystem benefits as well. Um, animals. Uh, pollinators, uh, flowers, all the things that uh, people really like to see. And so there's been a lot of work done over the years on the impact on the agricultural hydrology, the water quality, um, but there had not been uh, any exploration into the microbial impacts. And so we were proposing that through intercepting uh, the manure der derived runoff of antimicrobial resistant bacteria and genes, we would see reduction in that runoff through the increased infiltration. If you've ever seen the, the roots of a prairie system, they can go like 20 feet deep. So there's really great increased potential for um, infiltration, reduction in runoff. It slows that flow down. And so that in any of those uh, contaminants or resistant organisms that are associated with the particles and the sediment that's moving off site would then be able to settle out into these prairies um, and then reduce their concentrations in, um, in the discharge. And so similar to the kind of setup that, some, that Shannon was just describing, we also conducted uh, rainfall simulation experiments. Um, you can see our setup in, in the bottom right. Um, manure application is typically done um, in late fall. And so we uh, did these experiments after the harvest and uh, before the frost had, had moved in. And so on the next slide, we can see a little bit more detail on the experimental setup. Um, okay, so here uh, you can see the two pictures on the bottom. 
um, showing the kind of the inside of the rainfall simulator. The tarps were used to prevent the wind from interfering. Um, and then uh, the schematic on the right shows the layout where we had different combinations where uh, manure was applied um, upstream um, and then there was a prairie strip and then we collected the runoff at the outlet. So the three different treatments were uh, a prairie strip that had no manure, um, a prairie strip with manure, and then we had just a manure only cropland area. Uh, we applied the rainfall about three inches per hour and then collected that runoff at pretty uh, short increments about every five minutes after the start off of runoff. Um, we did uh, test separately the sediment and the water. So we centrifuged those samples so that we could see um, the difference between the resistant organisms and genes that remained in suspension versus those that were pelleted in the sediment. Um, we extracted the DNA and then we ran a, a biomark, which is a high throughput qPCR system. And here you can see the results. I know this is a really busy figure, but I think it's also a nice way to visualize a, a lot of data. And so along the left, you can see the different genes that we tested. Um, we had a variety of different genes to re represent. Um, the TET genes are the presence of resistance to tetracyclines. Uh, the ERM genes are resistance to macrolides. Uh, SOL genes are uh, sulfa drugs. And then we had some uh, mobile gen genetic elements. Um, and so when you look at the three different treatments, so we had the strips plus no manure, plots one, two, and three. We had the strip plus manure. So in this case, the strip, the prairie strip was treating that manure and then we were collecting that sample downstream. And then in the last set, you can see that there was no strip, but there was also manure. And essentially the brighter the color, the yellows and the oranges mean higher concentrations of these uh, genes that we were detecting. And then the lower, the grays um, and the, the purples are lower concentrations, okay? And so you can see from the strip plus no manure, we did to detect some of these genes. So some of these genes were present in the environment, um, but we also had the lowest presence of the antibiotic resistant genes and also the mobile genetic elements that we were looking for. Um, and then plot seven, eight, and nine, which are on your right, you can see we had the highest detection of both resistant genes and mobile elements. Uh, the strip plus manure is where we had that treatment. And of course, we didn't have all of our plots that would cooperate and give us similar results. So you can see uh, plots five and six, the resistant genes and mobile elements were uh, comparable to the no manure plots. So we saw great levels of reduction, um, but then uh, plot four showed higher detection um, than, than our control. Um, one thing that was unique, uh, you know, we tried to select sites out in the field that are all very similar, but plot four did have a higher flow rate. And so that indicates that the, uh, you know, the precipitation event and the amount of flow that occurs is going to also impact how effective the prairie strips can be in, in treating um, these resistant organisms. But overall, prairie strips appeared to have some real promise in reducing the movement of antimicrobial resistance um, from agricultural fields into surface waters. Um, and now I'm going to talk about a watershed monitoring project. And so um, this has also been funded by uh, USDA um, and it's going to be in collaboration. It's also some new work in this space. It's going to be in collaboration with Shannon's group and some other folks at UNL. Um, and I'm presenting uh, Tim Nair's uh, master's work here. And so the Black Hawk Lake is a watershed in uh, kind of the uh, central part of the state of Iowa. Um, very hydric soil, so we do have a lot of that tile drainage, and it's also very highly um, uh, agricultural production. So the majority of the watershed is under 
uh, corn and soybean um, rotations. And this project has been funded through the monitoring of this project through the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. So we've had a long-term monitoring study since 2015 to see what the impacts of conservation practices are on the Black Hawk Lake water quality um, after implementation of a total maximum daily load. This was a watershed where there was a lot of movement and a lot of conservation practices were installed. Um, it's also a watershed that has a fair amount of uh, manure. And so because of that, it's also a great opportunity for us to look at the antimicrobial resistance. And so you can see from this figure, the red dots are uh, beef uh, manure, the blue or swine uh, manure facilities. Um, and then we also have estimated the areas that we believe um, have previously received manure application or the dark brown is if they currently receive manure application. And um, to date, there have been relatively minor changes in the level of implementation of the management practices over the study period. Okay, and so here we're gonna uh, dig in. We have two sub watersheds, which are quite small, and we call them 11 and 12. Um, and they're right next to each other. They're around 550 acres each. And so it really set us up for a paired watershed study where you have two sites right next to each other, a very similar geology, soils, um, hydrology. And so from that point of perspective, we've been able to monitor these over time and also see what the differences in export of antimicrobial resistant genes might be from these two watersheds. So 11 um, is shown uh, with low uh, levels of BMP implementation. So, uh, and then the different BMPs are defined, but really the point is when you look at the aerial extent of implementation, we have a low, uh, low level of BMP implementation, and then we have a subwatershed 12, which has a really high level of BMP implementation, almost some, some conservation practice uh, throughout almost the entire uh, aerial extent of subwatershed 12. And so just to show you a, a few results from the study, um, the low BMP catchment is also manure amended, while um, the high BMP watershed 12, uh, we don't think receives manure. And so this does give us the opportunity to compare the manured versus the no manured watershed. And so the data that we're showing here is the tylosin resistance. Um, and so the percentage of the uh, bacteria that are resistant to tylosin um, over two years, 2017 and 2018, and from the two locations. Um, and what we can see is that the uh, catchment that did have manure had a higher export of antibiotic resistant bacteria in 2017. So again, this is the phenotypic resistance. So we collected the samples, um, filtered them, uh, and grew these resistant organisms in tylosin-infused auger and tetracycline. Um, and then we also looked at the, um, the resistant genes. In the next slide. Okay, and so similar to uh, the results that Shannon presented, this is a stacked, we're showing kind of a stacked plot of the different resistant genes, and this is the relative abundance. Um, and here, the low BMP uh, catchment again received manure, and we saw at least in one year that there was a higher export of resistant genes, and that was in 2018. And then the different colors represent the different genes that we uh, were able to detect, and those are, as I said, kind of all stacked on top of each other. So what's interesting here is that we do also see um, fairly significant amounts of some of these resistant genes and their indicators coming from uh, Watershed 12, which has high levels of BMPs and, and not uh, a good source of manure as far as we know. Um, so in some years, there were no significant differences, 2017, uh, between those two sub-watersheds. And then um, finally, uh, we also were able to look across the season um, and see when were some of these higher levels of resistant genes observed. 
Um, and so on the left, you can see the TET-M, ERM-F, and ERM-B. So the ERM genes are macrolide resistance, and the TET is a tetracycline resistant gene. Um, again, over the two years, 2017 and 2018, um, and different monitoring locations throughout the watershed are actually presented here. Um, and in general, we were able to see that the ERM-B, so that tylosin-resistant gene, was highest in the post-harvest season um, in 2017 and pre-planting season in 2018. So um, manure application does typically occur in the fall um, after harvest has occurred or before planting, and that was reflected um, in our uh, sampling collection, so the samples that we collected in the field. Um, but then when we looked at the ERM, F, and TET, M, we weren't able to see uh, significant differences among the seasons. So again, uh, you know, we know what's happening um, in the field and when manure application is occurring, and yet uh, we aren't necessarily able to uh, detect those activities with um, some of the genes that have been pretty good indicators with time. So um, again, indication that more work is needed as far as how do we track uh, the resistance through the environment and what are truly the best indicators that we should be using. And then just to wrap up, uh, so kind of our, our big picture message for this talk is that we can find both animatics and um, resistance genes in uh, various environmental compartments. We can find them in soil and manure in uh, various types of water. Um, and so understanding their movement and ultimately their impact on, on human health or, or animal health is really important. Uh, we also have um, presented a number of studies that we've conducted looking at both manure management strategies and edge of field um, studies, which can both be mitigation points for AMR and for antibiotics. So there's things that we can do with how we're applying manure, when we're applying it, um, as well as you know the the uh, system that we're setting up at the edge of field to help um, contain these um, or remove these um, substances from water that may be running off of a crop field. And so with that, we would both just like to acknowledge uh, different funding sources and collaborators. Um, from my perspective, I just want to thank um, some collaborators here at UNL, as well as USDA, and then funding from NIFA, USDA NIFA and the National Park Board. Yeah, and we've also um, have acknowledgments for the USDA ARS, Tom Mormon and Heather Allen were both strong uh, collaborators for many of these study, uh, studies. Um, Dan Anderson and Adina Howe, as well as the students who have all worked on this project. And then we've had um, funding from NIFA, uh, the National Pork Board, uh, and EPA, um, as well as some support from NSF for the graduate students.